electrodynamics, this one's tough. Let's just get into it because we've got a lot to do and it's going to be confusing, but important. So we're going to talk about the magnetic vector potential. And so I want to erase that and I want to start talking about the electric potential because we, if we understand the electric potential, it will help us understand the boom electric potential. And then we'll get into the magnetic vector potential. So remember where this originally came from. I mean, way back, the first thing you did, you said, okay, we said the work energy says work is the change in energy, and that's going to be equal to the integral of F dot DL. Now, if we know that we have a conservative force, we can move this to the other side of the equation and make it an energy. And so we have uh, work. Well, we would, in this case, let's say it's zero, and it's going to be delta kinetic energy plus delta electric potential energy. So the delta electric potential energy is going to be Q times the integral of E dot DL negative. It became negative because we moved to the other side of the equation. Now, with that, we said the electric field was 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over R squared R hat. And when, the, when you do the integral, we get V is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over R for a single point charge with respect to infinity. Okay, that's what we did. And so there was a negative here because you get a negative when you take the work done by a force and you move it to the other side of the work energy equation. That, that had a physical significance. We're not going to have that same significance in the magnetic potential, but the vector potential, but it's still, it's still going to, there's still a negative sign that we need to think about. Okay, we're not done yet. So also in electric potential, we had the following. We had, um, we had Gauss's law. So we've been writing Gauss's law like this. Del dot E is rho over epsilon naught, the charge density. That's the differential version of Gauss's law. Uh, we also had this. Del cross E was equal to zero. The curl of the electric field was zero. And that's only true in static electrics, right? In electrostatics. Once the, the things are moving, it's not always true. So there's a vector potential, there's a vector identity that says del cross del V is equal to zero. Well, if that's the case, then I can just say, oh, well, del cross E, the curl of E is zero. So I can say E is that by the vector identity. So del V, the electric potential, is E. But we wanted it to be negative, remember? It was negative before, so we're going to make it negative again. Or we can put the negative over here. And that still works. I can put in a negative del V in there, and I take the cross product. It has to be zero. So let's let the electric field be the gradient of the potential. We did that. Okay. Now, let's say that I have, remember, I know the electric field. I erased it already. E. 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. I'm going to write it in differential form. Rho dV over R squared R hat. I know that. I also know I can write, this is in spherical coordinates, so I can write the del operator in spherical coordinates. It's partial with respect to R, R hat, plus 1 over R, the partial with respect to theta, theta hat plus 1 over r sine theta, the partial respect to phi, phi hat. So let's just say, what if I take del of 1 over r? I get, well, I'm going to take the derivative of this. I get negative 1 over r squared r hat. So 1 over r squared r hat, I can move this over here, negative. I can put that in up here, and I can write E as negative 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught rho dV del 1 over R. 
That gives me the one over r squared r hat. And since this is an integral and the, the derivative, the vector derivatives, I can switch the order and I get negative del 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught rho dv over r. And so that's also why there's a negative there, right? Because there's my electric potential in differential form. Okay, now one more thing with electric potential that's important. <clears throat> Remember, Gauss's law, let's put those two things together. So I have Gauss's law, del dot E is the charge density over epsilon naught, and uh, del, negative del V is equal to E. So if I put that in here, I get del squared V is negative rho over epsilon naught. That's important. But if that's true, then V is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. I'm kind of sloppy this morning. 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught rho dv over r. Those two things go together. OK, so that was a review of electric potential. Now let's jump over to the magnetic field. So in the magnetic field, we have two important identities. The first is this, del dot b is 0. This says that the divergence of the magnetic field is 0. This is Gauss's law for the magnetic fields. It says there's no magnetic monopoles. Now, we write Ampere's law as b dot dl is mu naught i n. Um, Stokes' theorem says that the closed path integral of a vector field is equal to the surface area bounded by that same thing of the curl, the flux of the curl, del cross b dot n hat da. That's Stokes' theorem. I can write the total current passing through this surface bound by that as a surface integral too. I can say this is equal to the integral of the current density dot n hat da. Well, right here, if that's the, oh, there's a mu naught. So if the integrals are the same, well, then I can say the integrands are the same. So I get del cross b, that part has to be equal to that part, mu naught j. So these are our two starting identities that we need to use, OK? Getting my notes because I forget stuff all the time. So if del dot b is 0 and del cross b is mu naught j, could we say, and we can, let's just say b is del cross some other function a. So if I put that in right here, I get del cross del cross a. Now we can look up this vector identity. This double derivative vector derivative is going to be equal to del of del dot a minus del squared of a. I don't need that right there. That's a vector identity. So don't forget, that's in your book. So if you, if you have the book, I'm using Griffith's, uh, it's right here. Ve second derivative number 11. See, I didn't make that up. It's right there. Oops, I dropped my papers. That's fine. Okay. So if that's true, now, that's not very useful, except that if I go back up here and I say del of del dot a, del, so wait, del cross a, is equal to zero, right? That's that up here, del dot. Well, I can choose, that means I can, I'm gonna get a del dot a equals zero. And I can choose, this is important, choose del dot a to be anything. 
So I can choose this to be such that this term is zero. I can choose that. And if that's the case, I get the following very important equation, negative del squared A equals mu naught J. Notice that that looks a lot like what we had before, del squared V is negative rho over epsilon naught. It's very similar. This is the vector Laplacian. We got a negative sign, negative sign. This is the scalar, but still, it's the same thing. And we're going to call A the vector potential. So, let's go over here. Remember, del squared V, negative rho over epsilon naught, and that gave me V is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Let's put 1 over 4 pi, 1 over epsilon naught, the integral of rho dV over R. And that was how I defined potential. This is the vector Laplacian, the vector Poisson, Poisson equation, because it has not equal to zero. But I can write this as three equations. I can say the, this, the Poisson of Ax, because A is a vector, not a scalar, is equal to negative mu Jx. I can say del squared Ay is negative mu naught Jy. I can say del squared AZ is negative mu naught JZ in Cartesian coordinates. So from this, I get it's the same form. So that means that AX is 1 over 4 pi, F, not epsilon naught, not 1 over epsilon naught, but I have mu naught. I have the negative sign. So I get mu naught integral JX dV over R. And if I do that for all the other ones too, I get an AY, I get an AZ, I get AX. I can put them all back together and I can say this, A vector is mu naught over 4 pi, the integral of J dV over R. And that is your vector potential. So if I know the vector potential, then I can find the magnetic field. So I can go back over here and say B is the curl of A. So now we, we have an analogous system for our electric potential, electric field, electric charge density. We have the same thing with magnetic field, magnetic vector potential, and the current density. And so this is the whole thing that we're talking about here. Why would you want to do this? Well, just there's a couple of important things. Sometimes it's easier to find the vector potential than the magnetic field, and then from the magnetic field, from the vector potential, find the magnetic field. On top of that, this is not a unique thing. But if I find a value, a, a function that satisfies my equation right here, then the uniqueness theorem says if it matches the boundaries, then it, if it works on the boundaries everywhere, then it's fine. It's the same thing. It's a solution. And so we can use this to solve more complicated magnetic field problems, but that is the magnetic vector potential. Now, it's not going to make sense until you start working on it. Um, so we're going to do some examples. We're going to find the vector potential, use that to find the magnetic field, and show that we get the same thing, and then we can use it for more complicated situations. The end. Talk to you later.